Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's lunchtime seminar. Is that the camera up there? Yeah. Look at the camera. Um, I'm Diana Safeti. I'm the head of Department of Public Health, for those who don't know. Um, and it's my great honour and privilege to introduce to you Professor John Potter. I've got notes, so although I know John quite well, you still need notes to introduce him. Let me just tell you how esteemed he is. He's currently the Chief Science Advisor at the Ministry of Health. He's also a Professor at the Centre of Public Health Research at uh, Massey University, um, Adjunct Professor at University of Canterbury, and he's Emeritus Professor of Epidemiology at University of Washington. He's also still Senior Advisor at Fred Hutchinson Can Cancer Research Centre. Um, that, for those of you who don't know, uh, is in New York, and it's one of the most uh, substantial... Se Seattle? We're just close to New York. It's in America. <laughs> Um, but one of the, the most substantial um, cancer research um, organisations in the world. It's, it's a world-leading um, cancer research um, organisation. He's had a, a long and very distinguished career, which is focused on uh, cancer primarily, but particularly nutrition, environmental and host factors relating to cancer. But he's sort of, he's sort of expanding out into um, planetary overload and the importance of really thinking big. And he's going to be talking a little bit about that today. Um, but also, um, he previously led the Division of Public Health Sciences at the Fred Hutchinson Centre of uh, um, Cancer Research, which is not in New York. Um, and that is um, one of the biggest and most um, uh, sort of most productive uh, groupings of public health scientists, again, anywhere in the world. So that was a really substantial uh, position to hold. He chaired the international panel that produced the seminal um, report on food, nutrition, and the prevention of cancer. He was also the chair of the scientific committee of the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And he's won numerous uh, research awards and prizes. He's published um, nearly 700 journal articles, chapters, and books. So really, what are the rest of you doing? Um, and his, his H index is 110. For those of you who don't know what an H index is, it means he's got at least 110 papers that have been cited at least 110 times. So again, that makes the rest of us feel a bit bad. Um, I also count John as a friend, colleague, and mentor, so it's my great pleasure to hand over to him. Thank you, John. Diana, thank you. Um, now you're going to expect a really good lecture, aren't you? Mm, okay, I'll do my best. Um, there really is an important nexus at the heart of what I want to talk about, and that's where we're going here. Um, it's this nexus here, where um, the diet and food choices influence our health. That's not a surprise. But they also influence, obviously, the way we raise food. And that turns out to have an impact both on the environment and on what's happening with the climate. But the climate also changes the way in which we can raise food, which in turn affects the food supply, which loops back to the possibilities of diet and food choices. And then climate change itself is having an impact on our health. So I'm gonna try and run through a bunch of these and pull them together for you, um, sometimes just illustratively and sometimes perhaps with a little more detail. But just to remind you about the importance of the disease burden in New Zealand, um, that most of the disease that disease burden in New Zealand is about non-communicable disease. There is a small amount that is associated with um, infectious diseases and some associated with injuries and trauma, but most of it is associated with uh, non-communicable diseases. And it turns out that if you look at, um, and these are the, the health losses, and many of you will know how some of this work gets done, um, but the, if you just look at the health losses attributable to specific risk factors, diet, high BMI and alcohol um, are, together account for almost a third um, of the health losses we have in New Zealand. And I'm going to talk about some of those things in the broader context. 
And just to remind you about this as well, because we remember that tobacco has been our major source of um, health loss. It is now the case that in New Zealand, irrespective of how you measure it, whether it's in attributable dailies or you look at it as a, an age standardized rate per thousand people, um, BMI is now more important as a cause of disease burden than tobacco. Let me switch to this set of topics, if you like. The following are rare in nature. Sugar, salt, unless you live by the sea coast, in which case salt is not a particularly rare, but sugar, salt, fat, meat, and alcohol are all um, rare in our environment up until about 10 to 15,000 years ago. Wild humans did not have access to these in any much quantity at all. And the same is true to the, for the list on the right, which has to do with um, the drugs that we, uh, one way or another, tend to favour. And as I note there, we have a taste for them all. And if you think about the impact that has on us, um, because they're rare, it doesn't matter if we indulge occasionally and there were no deleterious consequences. So you can imagine our ancestors, um, you know, finding a tree full of overripe fruit and we're all sitting under the tree um, getting a little bit drunk or a lot drunk, provided we got there ahead of the chimpanzees who do this as well. Um, so we sit under the tree and we have a, a, a wonderful sing song with somebody keeping an eye out for the leopards. But that would have been the alcohol consumption maybe once in a lifetime for a lot of people. Now, what do we do? We have, we have, because these are rare and because we don't actually consume them, historically we have not consumed them very often, there are no curbs to, to where we go with these things. And so we haven't evolved any natural curbs on their overconsumption because it didn't hurt. Now, what do we do? Well, our response to their rarity, once we'd established that we didn't just have to gather and hunt, was to cultivate them to keep, them, keep ourselves in calories and comfort. And this has led us to raise our food and our drugs in more and more intense ways. And that's the problem of monoculture. Throughout human history, we raised and consumed quite modest amounts of some of these things even after we had settled down in agricultural communities. So meat consumption in traditional agricultural societies was probably no more than five to 10 kilograms a year. There probably were some occasional bursts, um, but a lot of this had to do with the amount of meat that was actually available. And the per capita con sugar consumption is in the same sort of region, even up to about 1700, you can imagine, the Brits would be the only ones who would have this information, right? They actually knew that sugar consumption from all sources, so that included honey and fruit and everything, was about two kilograms a year. What, what does that look like in New Zealand now? Um, meat consumption is now around 120 kilograms a year, so there's about a 12 to 24 fold increase over a fairly short time, evolutionarily speaking, just to keep you in mind, India is around three kilograms a year. So they're in, in, the, in the traditional sort of uh, range for humans. And then the per capita sugar consumption in New Zealand, um, and this is just a few years ago, it's around 40 kilograms a year. So it's again, this massive increase. Internationally, um, this is what's been happening to meat consumption in the world. Um, so you can see that it's gone up here from, um, from quite low levels in the 60s. Um, and a huge amount of this is a consequence of what's been happening in China. Um, very big changes in, in Chinese. Notice that India, despite the same rapid economic development, and this has to do with the way in which food choices get made in India. There's a lot of the... Uh, population of vegetarian by philosophic or religious conviction. And so they have not gone through this massive rise in meat consumption. What I'm going to show you is what happens when our demand and our 
um, capacity increasingly stretch what we can raise. And I'm going to give you three examples. And I'm going to talk about cereals. I'm going to talk about meat. And I'm going to talk about sugar. So this is the way these slides are going to, going to pull together. Um, the, the central focus is, in, is here for what we're talking about. These are the products that we're interested in. Um, and these are the inputs that have changed the way we produce these things. I can talk to you about enclosures at, at some length in the UK, uh, impacted hugely the way in which food was raised, but basically it was a land grab by the rich for the poor, from the poor. Nowadays, the UK has increasingly switching to prairieization of their, their uh, cereal growing, and what you're getting as a consequence, I'll tell you in a minute. Here are the other inputs into the system. Mechanization, which is not, uh, which was, is a relatively recent uh, input. Fossil fuel use, pesticides and fertilizers. Um, we've seen uh, uh, the emergence of GM varieties, although not massively in the area of cereals yet, although there are some places in the world where that's increasingly true. Um, so enclosures and prairieization of the landscape basically gets rid of lots and lots of open, of, of, of forest land, of the Brits originally had hedgerows and they're increasingly getting rid of them. Um, lots and lots of land that was otherwise um, much more rich in its ecology has become increasingly dominated by raising crops. Um, the Im impact of mechanization, um, it, it, certainly climate disruption from, from fossil fuel use, a decrease in physical activity, far more human calories per um, per calorie raised now than, say, uh, 100 years ago. Um, decrease in employment, which is not a trivial issue. In One good thing, increased longevity. Certainly people working in, in, in um, this sort of environment um, died much younger than we see now, and that's partly due to the amount of work they did, physical work. We see uh, pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids, um, are a major player in the way in which honeybees aren't uh, functioning as well as they used to. Fertilizers have a major impact on the way in which the soil works. GM varieties, and, and there are sort of two big things about um, genetically modified food. One is to incorporate um, things like Bacillus uh, thuringiensis, at which, which is a, um, automatically um, produces a, a pesticide, or you can go to the, and, and this, this ends up affecting other species. Um, again, simplifying ecologic structures, um, or you can make them, make the GM varieties resistant to herbicide use, um, like Roundup. Um, and the, the result of this sort of thing here um, glyphosate is associated with lymphoma. Um, it's also associated with herbicide resistance in the world. There are now about um, 1,500 species of weeds that are resistant to the uh, Roundup that was incorporated. Roundup varieties were in Roundup resistant varieties were created by plants, but they're doing it themselves out there. So that leads to more herbicide use, and you get a cycle here of increasing problem. So the sorts of things that we want to produce out of cereals were flour and alcohol maybe, but one of the things that's happened in the US particularly is raising other food fractions. They use massive amounts of, of uh, corn syrup. And corn, uh, the fructose from corn syrup is really quite nasty stuff in all sorts of ways associated with diabetes and obesity and so on. And we've also got the problem of the amount of alcohol that we can now make because we raise the crops and all the things associated with alcohol. Um, Nick's busy modeling alcohol at the moment. He's got money from HRC. We have the same kind of picture going on with sugar cane. We, we set out to produce um, sugar um, and alcohol, but we began our large scale growing of sugar and alcohol by kidnapping and slavery. Um, slavery, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, uh, kidnapping and um, 
so on, in, particularly in the South Pacific. Um, and the job conditions were pretty much slavery anyway. Biologic pest control has been a really interesting problem in Australia. Um, talk about that in a minute. Again, mechanization, fossil fuel use, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers. Um, and the whole structure of raising sugarcane, again, has massively simplified a lot of ecologic changes. Um, and, and we've got here in Australia, I don't know how many of you know that um, there was a beetle that was a problem in the cane fields and somebody thought, oh, this is a good idea. We'll get the thing that feeds on the beetles and we'll introduce them. Four cane toads were introduced in Australia um, around the turn of the 20th century. Um, those cane toads have now spread as far west as Darwin and as far south south of Sydney, um, and they are, basically nothing will touch them. They eat lots of other amphibians and them, themselves are, are largely resistant to anything because they're quite toxic. Um, and uh, once, a, once a dog has eaten one of them, it'll never eat another one um, because the, they, they, they secrete a um, hallucinogen on their shoulder pads. Um, there was a jokes about smoking toads, but it didn't work very well as I understand it. Um, same sort of associations with mechanization and, and, and fossil fuel use. Herbicides are associated with mangrove diet back, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Pesticides are associated with increased crown of thorns on the reef. Um, fertilizers affect on, on coral and effects on fish. Um, again, we've got this problem of the amount of sugar that we consume is associated with diabetes and obesity, as well as caries in children. The, the dentists are busy removing primary teeth in children these days in New Zealand. And then again, the same sort of pattern with chronic disease and alcohol. Um, maybe this is a saving grace. We tend to think about monocultures and industrial agriculture as being an important part of the world, but it actually um, raises only about a third of of the world's food. About 20% comes from fishing and hunting and back gardens, and about half comes from small mixed traditional farms. Um, nonetheless, we have a problem. And here's the third one of my examples, and it's this one's about using animals to raise meat and eggs. Um, and what are we using here? Well, all of these things um, are important inputs into, deliberate inputs, um, into the way in which we raise animals in the world. I appreciate that the use of human food to feed animals is not a big deal in New Zealand, but it's a big deal in the US. Um, and so what are, we, what, are the, what are the downstream consequences of this? Um, in places like Australia where, where um, water depletion, but it's not the only place, aquifer depletion because of over, overuse of water to feed, to, to water animals. Um, huge amount of water to, to raise um, small amounts of meat. Um, hormones are having important inf effects on, on fish. Um, the antibiotic resistance because, again, less of a problem in New Zealand, but we don't actually know the scale of the problem, but certainly in the US, big problems with antibiotic resistance associated with feeding antibiotics to animals. Um, rainforest destruction here. Um, and then, and this is again a particularly Australian problem because you've got hard-footed animals running across a country that had only ever seen soft-footed animals. Um, and huge amounts of Australian topsoil blow out to sea every year. Um, we've got methane, nitrous oxide um, production, and that is associated with climate disruption. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then you all know about the, um, the concentration of some of these bugs in animal raising. Um, and they can give us both infection and toxicity. And if we decide that we're going to kill these off because the American food supply is rotten with E. coli because of the way they raise uh, their meat, um, we, we overcook it in order to make sure the bugs are dead and that produces carcinogens. Um, and we end up with both of the the meat itself and the carcinogens from overcooking are associated with cancer, but um, this lot are associated with other chronic diseases as well. And then there's, there's combined, sorry, confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs, which is how the Americans tend to raise their beef. 
um, particularly, but it's also true for veal and it's true for chickens and it's true for pigs. Um, and these are actually very nice places to um, generate flu. We've even seen vaccine recombinations from two different uh, flu vaccines being used in, in, a, in a pig and ending up recombining and producing something quite nasty and toxic. You've got groundwater pollution on a grand scale. Um, and the, the other thing that happens is because of this worry here, this worry here, um, we tend to end up deciding that we suddenly need to kill off animals in large numbers. And sometimes it's preventive uh, or therapeutic among the animals itself. And sometimes it's defensive as in killing off buffalo, um, bison in the US or, or uh, badgers in the UK. Just to remind you that there are, is indeed sort of direct association between some of the things that we're doing. Um, processed meat association with um, the relative risk of colorectal cancer and death from cardiovascular disease involved in both. This is, a, this is just to remind you about the various greenhouse gases that are importantly associated with, with animal raising. Uh, and they, they differ in the way they work. Um, methane is quite potent, um, but is short-lived in the atmosphere. It's much more potent as a greenhouse gas than um, CO2 is, but over a short period, it's about 86 times over the first 20 years. But because it departs from the atmosphere, it does a kick to warming and then it goes away. But of course, if you continue to increase the amount of methane you're producing, then this, this will continue to rise as a result of methane. This is warming impact. Um, the, uh, on the other hand, CO2 uh, tends to continue to rise long term. It remains in the atmosphere for a very long period. And ni nitrous oxide actually, which is associated in New Zealand particularly with, um, with urine in, in cattle and the ground, um, you end up with uh, it flattening off after about 200 years. But the combined impact of these uh, as a load of greenhouse gases largely associated with animal raising, uh, animals now account for about 15% of the anthropogenic climate warming that we're seeing. And this is the sort of thing I was talking about for um, using what could be human food um, as animal food. And you can see this massive increase in the imports of, in China, the imports of soy from South America. And here you can see the value of, of, the, um, of the world's raising of animals as a proportion of the total value of agriculture. And you can see that it's, it's a huge proportion, even though uh, in some sense, the amount of meat that humans need is actually quite small. It's accounting for somewhere between 20 and 50% of the value of our whole agricultural system. There's also some interesting things about the way in which the world has changed. Th these are fascinating data because they're, they're wheat prices um, from the uh, 13th century all the way through to the end of the 20th century. And what you can see is that um, th you can see two things. One, one is that it's pretty volatile through a lot of history, but that it's specifically come down um, over quite some time, uh, over recent time. The, the price has come down and down um, over recent time. And, and you can see here's another way of looking at the variation. You can see that it's flattened quite a lot. So, so food supplies become less volatile. Food, food price and therefore food supply, what people can afford to eat, has become less volatile. More recently, however, and this is from the climate change report from the Intergovernmental Panel in 2014, food prices have begun to spike. And it's not entirely clear whether this is just due to increases in oil prices, which it's part of it has been, because oil prices are down at the moment. Um, but it may also be due to the fact that we're getting climate change and changes in the availability of food. The, the world does not have a huge supply of food in store 
it's really quite distressing sometimes to think about that. Climate change and coastal losses are important too, because this is one that's waiting to sneak up on us, I think. We're seeing seagrass de decline in New Zealand. We're seeing bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. We're seeing mangrove inundation across the Indo-Pacific region, and we're seeing kelp forest loss in a variety of places, but including in Western Australia. Um, and these, all these coastal features are among many other roles, nurseries for fish and marine invertebrates. And therefore, combine this with overfishing and you begin to worry about whether or not we're going to have enough fish supply um, into the foreseeable future. Here's what's happening with seagrass. And this was published, uh, this came out in Niwa in 2009. And they were talking about the natural effect, impact on seagrass. We've lost a lot of seagrass around the coasts of New Zealand. Um, it, it, sometimes it comes back. There was a big loss in the, in the 1930s and then it, it reappeared. But look at what's happening now and you see pollution, physical damage from a variety of, of things that are going on in the coast, um, introduced species uh, competing with other, um, other natural uh, grazers, uh, and, and climate change, all having an impact on these, uh, on our capacity for maintaining coastal seagrass in its pristine nature. And then here's, here's one other way of thinking about the impact of, of sea level rises. Mekong Delta is one of the Earth's most productive regions. They get up to seven crops of rice every two years in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Um, and it's a major source of rice particularly, but shrimp and fruit as well. Climate change, drought, and increased salinity is causing several things to happen. One is major loss of crops, increasing poverty, and net out migration. This, this area is losing its people. They're fleeing to the cities. Uh, a lot like the way in which you saw the change in agricultural revolutions in the Western world causing um, big shifts towards cities um, in, in earlier times. But in 2015, 16, worst drought in the century, major intrusion of salt water over 80 kilo, kilometers inland destroyed a massive amount of crops. That sort of event is likely to be on the increase and likely to impact food supply quite markedly. We were talking about volatility, and here I'm going to give you volatility in two, um, two areas. One is maize, which is an important food in a lot of places. There are four maize exporting countries which account for most of the world's supply. Um, and if there's, this is a modeling exercise, but the probability of simultaneous production losses in these four countries, greater than 10% in any one year, is actually virtually zero at the moment but increases when we get to two degrees of warming up to 7% and we're already a lot of the way there and increases as almost certainty by four degrees of warming. So these are big threats of climate um, damage, climate warming to the damage to the food supply. And then you've got a, a similar pattern here, except this is, this is, these are actually empirical studies done on um, looking at the impact of temperature and other conditions on raising uh, vegetables and legumes. And there's a whole bunch of experiments, and these guys did a, a meta-analysis of the whole collection. And increase of CO2 gives you a slightly better production of these, which, which is, you know, the, the standard climate change design, um, denier response was, well, the CO2 will be good for vegetables. Yeah that's about the only thing it'll be good for. It isn't, turns out not to be good for raising cereals, um, but it may do some useful things for a small amount. But this is what happens when you've got ozone increase. This is what happens with reduction in water availability. You can lose about a third of your crop. Um, increases in salinity really matter um, because we'll see coastal inundation as a problem. And there, here, on a, on a temperature scale, you can again lose about a third with a four degree shift in, in temperature. So the, the impact on nutritional value is, is, is mixed here. So predicted changes in environmental exposures will lead to a yield in reduction in non-staple vegetables, that is not potatoes and so on, 
um, and, and legumes, but they are a major source of our nutritional variety and a lot of our micronutrients. So it's a really important part of our diet. Where adaptation possibilities are limited, it'll probably change global availability, affordability, and consumption relatively shortly. And then here's just some of the things about health consequences of climate change itself. Heat stress on people, and this is a real problem in people who work outdoors in, in, uh, high, in already tropical climates. Things like sugarcane workers or shifting to outdoor workers in, in places working in the tropics in Africa and Southern Asia and so on. Um, trauma from fire and flood is a real issue. Um, and we're seeing the number of fires that are popping up in the world at the moment. And a paper just out, which is sort of, and I'll show you the data. Um, I think I'll show you the data. Um, actually, there's, a, there's a, a, a direct association between ambient temperature and suicide rates. And I think it's a causal association. Um, secondary ones, you see shifts in disease vectors, intermediate hosts and pathogens. And we'll, we've seen um, some changes in that already we'll see others um, shifts in dengue fever distribution shifts in chicken chicken gurnia, shifts in um, probably see shifts in other diseases and then tertiary effects include famine of the sort we've just been talking about displacement of people of the sort that we've just been talking about but also conflict one of the major players in the in the, uh, the in the way in which isis arose in syria had to do with the fact that there were a whole lot of farmers who could no longer raise crops for their family, let alone for the country. Um, and they ended up uh, as being the backbone of the, of the insurrection in that, in that part of the world. Here's the ambient temperature depression and suicide story just come out. It's not even um, published, it's in press. Multiple decades of data from the US and, Can and Mexico one degree uh, increase in monthly average temperature, suicide rates rise in this way. And it doesn't matter which bits of the country you look at, hotter versus cooler, you see the same thing. And they also did this rather cool thing. They looked at depressive language in more than 600 million geolocated Twitter updates, and that suggested more depressive language with higher temperatures. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, that's the nexus we've been talking about, food choices, food raising practices, food supply, climate change environment and impact on human health. This is actually in my garden. Um, but the quote is the beginning of the last chapter, uh, sorry, last paragraph of Darwin's Origin of Species. And he said, it is interesting to contemplate a tangle bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, birds singing on the bushes, insects flitting about, worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. We seem increasingly to find ways to mock those laws. I think we're in trouble as a consequence. Thank you very much. Must be lunch. I'm just thinking I'm suddenly feeling quite depressed. <laughs> we have time for some questions for John. Philippa. Thank you, John. That was a very interesting systems account of the effect of food and climate change. In your position as um, Chief Science Advisor in um, the Ministry of Health, what do you think the role of the ministry is, and particularly in mitigation practices um, that have an impact on health? What, what is it and what could it be, should I say? I think what is it is close to nothing at the moment. Um, I, I think I'm allowed to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who's supposed to deliver free and frank advice. Um, the, the ministry um, is beginning to reassemble itself into something that might be an effective tool of policy and government um, at the moment. I don't think 
that's a good that would be a good description of what we've got um, I think that we need to think seriously about uh, we're, we're protected in lots of ways in New Zealand from from the way in which we do things we are, we're, we are a country that can raise a lot of food although we don't tend to raise our own cereals and we have shifted a lot of our food raising to think about how to make export um, money um, which has been good for some people and generally good across the economy but not good for everybody and certainly not good for the environment but those things are not particularly in the hands of the Ministry of Health they're in um, hands all over the place elsewhere um, I think we are facing serious issues around the fact that we live so the vast majority of the population live very close to the sea. Um, I think that's going to be turn out to be an issue. I think we will see impact more of, of climate change associated with both drought and flood and fire. And I think we've already had hints of that to add to our dangers of other sorts like earthquakes. Um, I'm really not sure that the ministry has, even if it were a fully functional ministry at the moment, which it, I again repeat, I don't think it is, but even if it were, I don't think it's got its hands on the levers that really matter in this story. We could, we could advise about, um, about food consumption, and I think there is some awareness in the population about um, food and alcohol misconsumption in New Zealand, but it's pretty minor and we could do way better than we do. Um, but we end up with sort of exhortation for most of it. We don't tax alcohol, for instance, which is um, a, a, a bad influence on our health, even if it's not a particularly problematic from a climate change perspective, it certainly is for human health. Um, alcohol damages fetuses, it damages alcohol, it damages adolescent brains, and it damages a lot of people later in life. Um, and we have a very weak taxation structure associated with alcohol. Um, we have no taxation on sugar, um, and we have a, uh, a, a massive overconsumption of meat and dairy products. So. You know, can we fix some of those? Probably, but I'm not, still not sure what the Ministry of Health does other than jump up on a soapbox, which I think I just did. Um, can just, I know I'm not supposed to have a follow-up comment, but given that we now have a wellbeing framework, which has social and health as a key part of that, I think it gives many opportunities for the Ministry to re-emerge from the cave and actually taking part in those cabinet debates uh, about the impact from everything from housing to food to transport yep. on health. I so I, and I think we're really, many people in the department would support you strongly in that. I, that, that has started to happen. Um, there was a meeting in Treasury day before yesterday, um, which uh, involved the science advisors and a bunch of Treasury, and we were across the board science advisors, so all of the all of the ministry science advisors, not just the social sector, and we began to try and pull together some coherence around some of those issues. Um, but it's it's a it's a delicate flower, um, and it needs nurturing. So, any good thoughts you have about how it might be nurtured will be gratefully received. About to be on it, so. Good. <laughs> Actually, as it happens, we had a meeting, Michael Baker and I, um, at the Ministry of Health yesterday, talking about some of these things and the acknowledgement there that they, they don't have the expertise or focus on really anything outside of health services and maybe the sort of the big determinants of, you know, smoking, obesity, they're comfortable with housing, yeah, not really their thing, um, you know, this kind of glo um, climate change, not really, but in, but actually starting to move towards understanding that they need to get more up to speed. And one of the things we offered was designing summer school courses, for example, specifically to try and upskill some people at the ministry to try and 
get a bit more expertise. In Good the, idea. Uh, yeah. So amongst other things. Marie, there was someone who was from... And it follows on from the questions you've had. person online is asking, what do public health departments need to do? I think one... I, you know, it isn't enough to talk about this stuff, but it is important to, to talk about this stuff. And we don't. We, we bury a lot of it. We don't talk about the, we don't talk about, um, the impact of a lot of the things that we do on environment. We don't talk about the transport system. We don't talk about um, physical exercise. We don't talk about, I mean, I don't mean nobody does, but there isn't a, it isn't, we're much more concerned about, you know, um, more, what I would think of as more trivial issues. We're tending not to think about the future of our country and the future, or the planet for that matter. Um, I think part of it is discussion. It isn't enough, but it's, if, if policies are going to be introduced that involve fairly radical changes, which they might need to do, then Clearly, we need to get, if not a consensus, at least an understanding of why people are wanting to push certain kinds of changes. Michael. Yeah, no, thanks, John. It's a great talk and uh, obviously quite frightening. And in a sense, um, I'd almost like to hear the next part of it, which I think Philippa was referring to and probably all of us in the room are very interested in, is what do we do about it? And you, it's really screaming out for a more integrated, joined-up decision-making which I think has been a mantra for public health ever since the Ottawa Charter of having healthy public policy that's linked up across sectors and intersectoral collaboration. So we've had that idea for uh, three decades probably, and probably even longer. I'm just wondering, do you see how we can achieve that? What would be your top pick of um, mechanisms, at least at a national level, where New Zealand could be less part of the problem? I know when I interact with, say, an agency like MPI, Ministry of Primary Industries, which in a sense does have control over some of these areas, do. its mission, its mantra is totally foot rammed on the accelerator for production mm -hmm. at all cost. Yep. And I'm just wondering at what point are they told actually you have to balance that against all these other considerations? Or maybe they're incapable of doing it because their culture is so different. Maybe we need to reformulate all of these key agencies with a completely different model. I mean, what do you think? It doesn't sound like subtle change is um, the solution here. Right. Um, I mean, one of the problems is that we, we have a particular view about how we should run everything and the way in which we view growth is the, is the thing that we pursue. Um, and, and there's n one of the key discussions, it seems to me, is, is there a way of bringing a, um, a change to our notion that uh, we always have to have more of whatever it is tomorrow than we had today, um, whether it's more food or it's more money or it's more cars or it's more... Um, because all of those mores are associated with more pollution, more damage to the environment, more impact on the climate, etc. We we are stuck with this view that tomorrow always needs to be more than today. Um, it, it, I mean, at some point, the planet's going to bite back. Um, at some point, we're going to be dealing with. I mean, nobody expected the 1919 flu epidemic. Um, we expect a flu epidemic, pandemic. Um, it's, th there are some things that we, we could end up with serious famine. We're already seeing huge numbers of displaced persons as a consequence of, of climate change. We're seeing people dying as a result of climate change, either directly or indirectly. We're seeing people associated with, you know, with, with deaths in fire, but we're seeing it in war and we're seeing it in famine. Um, and these, all these events are going to become more common. And we are buffered in New Zealand in a way that a lot of other places are not. Um, and we need, to, we need to acknowledge our, uh, that we've probably got a little bit more time than, than some other places. 
but we still need to have that conversation. I do not know, I am a humble scientist, I have no idea how to reorient government to get this right, but you're right, we need a different story about the way in which we run our society. We need the microphone down here. Um, Louise Signal, Louise Delaney and George Thompson wrote a very interesting commentary which was published uh, earlier this week about the impact of trade deals on health, really, or, or the lack of consideration of health within trade deals and the focus on economic growth. And I'm hoping that that's what Louise is going to comment on now. Well, it isn't, although I will mention that I, I do believe that um, the Ministry of Health has to get in behind um, a refocus on trade and investment agreements, um, because um, primarily because of damages to, um, well, the environment most, most preeminently, but, but also health as well. Um, and the Ministry of Health has not shown itself in recent times very proactive in saying trade is important for us as a ministry. They did have a representation in the TPP, um, not very effectively, but with some results in relation to pharmaceutical access. Um, but that... Um, some degree of capacity in the ministry on trade agreements and, and negotiations on them has seems to have disappeared as far as I know. So I don't know if you know any different on that one. I don't think there's anybody in the entire ministry who knows a damn thing about trade. Mm. So my second question... <laughs> My, my second issue is that I've sort of got, um, I, I've become aware very recently that there is, you know, a, a huge literature on issues to do with intergenerational justice and, um, and future generations and the knowledge that if, if future generations could talk, they would have bad things to say about how we carry on. Um, and so there is some ideas floating around about how to institutionalize a concern for the future in our present institutions, and Jonathan Boston has written on this. Um, and I'm quite interested in the idea of future generations being able to be represented legally and governmentally now, being able to sue, being able to say, this bit of legislation cannot proceed unless my interest, that of the future, and I'm standing up for them, um, <laughs> is taken into account. Uh, so are you interested in those sorts of ideas as, as a way of forcing us to think um, uh, as, as part of our stewardship role in relation to the future? It's, it's an important idea. Um, one of the problems with, with that sort of stuff is that if you wanted to sue in court, you would immediately have the problem of, I'm sorry, you have no standing. Okay, good. Then, then, then bring your legal expertise here. Um, I, I agree. Um, the, the, the thing about um, imagining we can go on trashing the environment and that somehow or other, as long as we die before it kills us or something, um, you know, the hell with the future generations. It's, it's a massive problem. And, and, but, but we barely have enough concern for those around us, let alone those 50 or 100 years in the future. We're not good at it. We don't have... When we don't have empathy, even for sometimes our fellow human beings. I mean, I, at the moment, I, I've been busy thinking about smaller problem, trying to think about policies related to, to, to drug use. Um, and all of, our, all of our solutions are punitive. Um, and most of the people who are um, drug users one way or another are victims. Um, and, and we can only think about how to punish them rather than how to solve the problem of, of a health problem. And it's a health problem and it needs a public health solution. So if we can't, if we can't do it on that level, um, I, I, I really worry. But if, hey, I, I'll run behind if you <laughs> carrying a banner, if you can get somewhere with that particular process, I think it's terrific. Well, we've gone slightly over time, so unfortunately we're going to have to bring it to a close now. But, but John, thank you so much for, um, to, for coming and speaking about this incredibly important issue, perhaps the most important issue that we're facing in our time. And, um, and I think it's a, you know, it's a great opportunity for everybody to meet you in your role as um, Chief Science Advisor as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Thank you all. Thanks.